it's really really an honor to us to have you in this seminar so uh this seminar will be uh organized by Before we start the seminar, uh, the host will be playing Indonesian Anthem and uh, Universitas Satya Negara Anthem. So for the host, uh, let's start the Indonesian Anthem first. That is Indonesian Anthem and our University Anthem. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the participants and the guest speaker here. Uh, before we start the seminar, the Dean, our opportunity, will be give his opening remark. 
opening speech about this today event. So for Dr. Sultan Raja Guguk, uh, Raja Guguk, the time is yours. Oke, okay, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. Good afternoon, Southern ladies and gentlemen. I am president of the Faculty of Social and Political Science at Satya Negara University of Jakarta. And it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you all to the special occasion I just lecture that promised to be intellectually and interesting today. We have the honor of hosting an expert in the field of international relation, Dr. Ngo Cho Bing. Dr. Ngo is the director of the Institute of China Studies at the University of Malaya, Malaysia. Is we have of Newlet in the interfaces of international relation, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, make him an expert on the subject we are here to explore. The theme of today's lecture is of paramount significance is the current global landscape as we develop into Asian effort in balancing power in the midst differently <clears throat> between the state of America and China. This topic will not be more considering the dynamic geopolitical shift and the evolving power play between two major forces in our world today. As we navigate through the complexities of international international relation, it is crucial for us of special sudden of future leaders to understand the delicate balance ASEAN threat to maintain in the in the face of the escalating rivalry between the United States and China. I extend my gratitude to Dr. Neo for guessing us with his present and sharing his expertise with our academic community. I ask thanks all of you for joining us in this intellectual. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the Dr. So uh, Sultan Gajagu for the opening remarks. Uh, all today, uh, All gathering today around the theme of this seminar is ASEAN effort in balancing power in the midst of rivalry between the United States of America and China. This timely discussion hold profound implication for the geopolitical dynamic that shape our world today. And we are privileged to have distinguished speakers get, guide us through the complexity of this subject. First, I will introduce Dr. Ngo first. Uh, Dr. Ngur Chobing Cho is the expertise of comparative politics, especially in Chinese politics, democracy and democratization, nationalism, civil society, Chinese foreign policy, and China-ASEAN relations. It's my great pleasure to introduce our, uh, our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Ngur also a professor and director of the Institute of China Study at the University of Malaya, Malaysia. His work expertise extends beyond academic realm. He, as he also served as non-resident scholar at Carnage, uh, Carnage China. Dr. Ngo received his PhD in public and international affairs from Northeastern University America. He also an editor of several books like Populism, Nationalism, and Nationalism in the South China Sea. Uh, uh, Dr. Ngo already write the several book like this uh, researching China in Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia and China exercise in mutual socialization that really really extend the uh, and explain the relation between China and ASEAN realm in addition Dr. Ngo has written more than 40 articles in scholarly journal and book chapter you can uh, read uh, several journal or book chapter by Dr. Ngo in his uh, Google Scholar account. 
Today, we are fortunate to benefit from his insight and deep understanding of the indicate and dynamic at play in Asia Pacific region or Indo Pacific regionalism in today's uh, perspective. It's such an honor for our department and university to have the Tengu as a speaker for today's lecture. As we embark on this intellectual journey, let us engage in truthful dialogue, fostering an environment where ideas can flourish and perspective can be shared. This, uh, the increased of ASEAN role in navigating the complexity relationship between the United States and China will undoubtedly will be uh, will be unraveled in the moment to come. Without further ado, I invite Dr. Cho, uh, Dr. Ngo Cho Bing, to enlighten us with his expertise and perspective of this pressing issue. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our distinguished speaker. For the speaker, the time the time is yours. Please welcome. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, moderator, for your very kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone here. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor uh, to be invited to provide this special lecture, uh, in particularly uh, to Universitas Satya Negara Indonesia. Uh, it's uh, again my pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, I would uh, 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 before I start and while the PPT is uh, being uh, ready, I would just like to share a little bit of an anecdote, uh, a little bit of a uh, our personal um, observation and experience. Uh, just now, uh, uh, there was a mentioning of my affiliation uh, with Carnegie uh, China. Of course, Carnegie is the uh, Carnegie refers to Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, which is a very well known uh, think tank uh, in the United States. And uh, Carnegie has a Carnegie China operations uh, in partnership with Tsinghua University. Uh, for many years, uh, but as the relationship became very, very difficult and also because of the pandemic, COVID uh, in China, um, the Carnegie China had to basically scale down its operations uh, in, uh, in Beijing with Tsinghua University. I mentioned this because uh, I was invited to be part of a think tank dele delegation visit to China just a couple of uh, weeks ago. As uh, US, uh, as China opened up, uh, they are inviting uh, many think tank scholars and uh, to revisit to revisit China, and uh, I was very honored to to participate uh, in that delegational visit. Uh, I could see that uh, how uh, both sides really really appreciated that opportunity of uh, engagement. Uh, I was quite a bit of a surprise uh, to because they were telling me a lot that that this kind of think tank uh, engagement had become very rare in Beijing, especially between the United States and China. And they were, of course, uh, they were meeting as uh, old friends and uh, and reached out to each other about, as a, at the track to level. Uh, what struck me is that uh, when they say that this kind of activity became very rare, uh, because uh, we are talking about in Beijing, you know, where there are supposed to be a lot of this kind of uh, think tank engagements and meetings. And uh, instead, if it, be, if, it, if it was talking became rare, that means that the, the engagements have really, really reduced uh, from both sides uh, a lot. So that was just a little anecdote that I share in a sense that how both countries used to have extensive exchanges and engagement despite all the issues and troubles uh, between them, but that have been kept going for a long time. Uh, but uh, I think in the past couple of years, uh, that had really, really uh, reduced to a very minimum level. And that is not good, of course, uh, for the bilateral relationship. But I think in the sense that all other countries are affected by this set of bilateral relation relationship. Uh, but I'm sure that they are picking up uh, the recent uh, summit between uh, President Xi Jinping and President Biden in San Francisco uh, have agreed uh, to... Uh, increase the kind of uh, people to people exchanges more. Uh, I think that is a good thing, and I'm sure that there are more and more lively uh, engagement between both sides, uh, which I hope will uh, continue to moderate uh, the behaviors from both sides and to contribute to certain kind of uh, stability. So I just start off with that kind of a, a bit long 
uh, personal observation about U.S.-China relations. Uh, I'm given the task today to talk about ASEAN's effort in balancing power in the midst of the rivalry between the United, United States and China. And to keep it short, basically, is the ASEAN-U.S.-China triangle, kind, uh, so to speak. And what uh, will be ASEAN's role in terms of positioning itself in the middle of this rivalry and how it can perhaps certain, uh, play certain kind of role uh, in uh, managing this uh, growing rivalry. Um, next slide, please. All right, uh, in order to, um, of course, have a little bit of a background, uh, it is necessary to kind of uh, uh, revisit the engagement between the US uh, and China. Of course, the US came in as the overwhelming superpower that had been with the world for decades already. And China was basically at one point, uh, one of the poorest countries in the world, despite being very large. Uh, but the China also uh, was a pivotal uh, country in many ways that shaped the contours of the, of the Cold War. Uh, Henry Kissinger, the most uh, famous uh, U.S. Secretary of State, uh, perhaps, uh, and the National Security Advisor when he served uh, President Nixon, uh, just passed away a couple of uh, days ago, I think. Uh, I think there were a lot of commentaries about uh, his legacy. Uh, a lot of people criticize him uh, for his role in so-called genocides or mass killings and so on and so forth. I think he was responsible for many of those from the official China side, the pivotal role in the engagement of uh, between the United States and China in the opening up of uh, China. So that will, that happened in the Nixon opening in 1972. Um, and uh, despite this opening, they did not proceed to have a normalization of diplomatic ties up until 1979. There was a, a gap. Uh, that gap basically was hindered by an issue that until today continue to exist and continue to be one of the most difficult issues for both sides to uh, resolve. Uh, that is the issue of Taiwan. Uh, the Nixon opening did not result in the immediate establishment of diplomatic ties. Well, it will cause, there were a number of factors, but one of the major factors that they couldn't get around how to how to resolve the U.S. relationship with Taiwan, the commitment to Taiwan, um, while at the same time reopening or re-establishing uh, ties with China, right? So there were a long period where both sides had to come back and forth to agree to a certain formula, and that formula was finally agreed upon in a very very vague way, uh, where both sides had their own interpretation, uh, that allowed the 1979 uh, diplomatic ties uh, to, be, uh, to be established. Of course, the United States uh, considered more in a sense that they agreed to uh, break the ties with the Republic of China on Taiwan. That was the, where the, the, the Taiwan's official name is about and to stop the alliance relationship. Uh, and uh, But uh, um, the US in 1979 also immediately enacted the U.S. Congress, uh, in particular, uh, the Taiwan Relations Act, in an effort to maintain uh, and boost the uh, abilities of Taiwan to stand on its own. Um, and then um, that basically began the engagement uh, of almost 20, 30 years, uh, up until, um, very, uh, uh, I'm sorry, up until recently. Each and every president of the United States and on their counterpart, each and every um, Secretary General of the Chinese Communist Party or the leadership of the Communist Party of China basically um, were basically committed uh, to this uh, relationship of engagement. It was truly mutually beneficial, right? Uh, whether uh, Reagan was strongly anti-communist, but uh, he eventually recognized the uh, utility of having a stable relationship with China uh, Bush, uh, uh, of course, faced the uh, 1989 uh, China's Tiananmen 
killings, uh, whether the United States uh, would continue to engage or start to impose stronger sanctions. Uh, and then I think Bush ultimately chose uh, to continue engage uh, despite the initial sanctions being imposed on China. Uh, Clinton was very, very supportive of uh, China's WTO membership. Uh, I remember Clinton when he campaigned for uh, the presidency, he criticized uh, Bush uh, China policy saying that he uh, criticized Beijing a lot, uh, being the butchers of Beijing, so to speak. Um, and then uh, President Bush Jr. Uh, initially also had a very frosty relationship with China. I uh, remember there was the so-called Hainan aircraft incident where the uh, air forces of China and the United States, United States collided. Uh, and then the relationship became very tense. Uh, but right after 9-11 attacks, China became a good partner, basically, uh, of the US. And Obama, of course, uh, had a pivot policy that was partly aimed to address the issue of balancing against the growth of China, which is true. But I think Obama also wanted to continue to engage China. All right. So that was basically the official, um, not, not official, I'm sorry, kind of the background uh, of this uh, several decades of engagement. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but that all came to an end uh, with the election of uh, Trump uh, in 2018. Uh, of Trump uh, presidency, uh, he um, visited China, one of the very uh, first foreign visits he undertook. Uh, and the, atmos the, the optics and the atmospherics of the visit seemed to be quite positive. Uh, China prepared a very grand reception uh, for, for Trump. And uh, they thought that they had Trump basically uh, taken care of uh, in terms of uh, committed back to the so-called engagement uh, approach. Uh, but things definitely turned out to be very, very different. And in just a few years' times, a number of uh, major differences uh, have basically escalated uh, to the point that uh, what we talk about the new Cold War or the Cold War 2.0 or the great rivalry or whatever we want to describe uh, this uh, present US-China relationship. Uh, of course, it started uh, as is very well known, the economic uh, side of the disputes, uh, market access, intellectual property, uh, so and so forth. That's where the tariffs uh, from the United States uh, came into being. But very soon, it uh, expanded to other areas, uh, technological rivalry. Uh, the US was uh, basically uh, very, very concerned about the expansion of China's uh, technological companies and also some of the efforts uh, of Chinese government to, uh, in USI, to steal the human talents, right? This thousand talents uh, program uh, from uh, US uh, higher education sector uh, to issues of human rights. Both sides already have a lot of uh, clashes on these issues and uh, further developments uh, in Xinjiang and Hong Kong continue to accelerated and on the South China Sea uh, and some other areas surrounding uh, China's uh, maritime neighbors, especially where there were also a number of uh, American uh, treaty allies. Uh, there were increases of China's uh, assertive actions uh, that greatly alarmed uh, the neighboring countries as well as uh, the United States uh, as well. Uh, so just to uh, quickly sum up, basically since 2018, the relationship was on a downward spiral. Uh, whether it was President Trump or President Biden, uh, they have committed uh, to a framework or a paradigm of competition uh, with China. A number of uh, policy uh, documents have been issued. There were many of them, but I think the kind of the uh, major uh, policy statements uh, were the three Indo-Pacific uh, uh, policies uh, or the three documents, policy documents with the name of the Indo-Pacific uh, on it. Right? Uh, two of them were issued under the uh, presidency of Trump and one of them was under the uh, United, uh, on, under the White House of uh, Pre President Biden, right? the most recent one, the Indo-Pacific Indo strategy of the United States. And together with this, uh, we see a lot more acceptance of this lexicon of the Indo-Pacific uh, the Indo-Pacific signify basically a very different, um, different 
ethos uh, compared to the old term, the Asia Pacific. The Asia Pacific retains certain kind of uh, optimal, uh, optimal uh, feelings or optimism about the future of the region or the world. Uh, it was still uh, basically a globalization uh, related term. Whereas the Indo-Pacific, uh, I think no matter how we want to uh, modify it or how to uh, uh, define it, I think it has a lot more uh, competitive uh, implications uh, within the term, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Bi Biden's administration basically um, has continuously emphasized that the relationship with China is one of competitions. Whether he used the phrase of compete, confront, cooperate, uh, with cooperate being the last items, uh, or invest, align, compete. Uh, this is another phrase that he had used before, uh, responsible competition. I think he used this, uh, this couple of phrases. Uh, they are not mutually exclusive, uh, but basically in the very first two, two years of his administration, he basically used this to define a uh, relationship uh, with China. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, differences between Republican and Democratic parties, but the China policy was one about continuity. Uh, last year, almost exactly last year, uh, October 2022, one of the major policy moves by the Biden government uh, was this export control targeting the semiconductor uh, sector of China and together with it, uh, a number of uh, legislations uh, uh, were put in place uh, basically to accelerate the technological uh, rivalry uh, and together with that with number of multilateral uh, groupings that have been uh, formed uh, with the United States at the leading power to put together some other countries uh, to exclude China. Of course, we see that there is a temporary stabilization or temporary halt of the uh, this kind of a rivalry uh, in the uh, summits uh, recently. But I think vast majority of the watchers of US-China relations uh, would not have too much of a optimistic uh, assessment. Uh, basically, this is just a um, a kind of a temporary stop, uh, if not uh, uh, a kind of a stop uh, for the uh, for the uh, downward spiral uh, in this relationship. Uh, but some would say that it's just basically uh, things will get worse before it get uh, worse, actually. So, well, we will see. All right, next slide, please. Um, the Taiwan issue continue to be the most uh, critical issue uh, from Beijing's perspective. Basically, um, this is from Beijing. Uh, I think three sides, all three sides, uh, US, China, and Taiwan side, three sides feel that um, they are being forced into corner uh, by their opposing sides uh, and resulting in uh, them necessary to take certain actions uh, to counter this uh, this uh, aggressive actions uh, by their oppo opposing sides uh, but all of, all three basically um uh have undertaken actions and from beijing these actions by the us uh were the major factors contributing uh, to the deterioration uh, of the relationship and making taiwan becoming more and more prominent uh, issue between the us and china uh, basically, starting from Trump and all the way uh, until uh, President uh, Bush, uh, including one of the uh, major uh, protests by uh, Beijing was the visit of uh, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi last year. I think it created a, a, a major, uh, kind of a major stabilization in a way. Uh, uh, in the in the relationship between all all three sides and also kind of. Uh, created the excuse uh, for China to increase its uh, military activities uh, surrounding the Taiwan uh, island, right, or the or Taiwan. Okay, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this, as you can see, uh, this is the uh, military activities uh, that uh, China undertook, and basically from there they started to normalize uh, this uh, military. Uh, activities surrounding Taiwan, uh, which of course uh, were creating a lot more anxieties on the US side as well as the Taiwan side uh, 
uh, and were not basically uh, helpful in stabilizing the uh, relationship. All right, next slide, please. All right, so Southeast Asia definitely uh, came in as an uh, uh, important arena uh, in this uh, rivalry. Uh, Southeast Asia was uh, geographically very close to, uh, it's very close to China, of course. Um, and then there were a lot of uh, China's uh, engagements and presence and influences uh, in the region, but it has also been one of the major uh, uh, regions where the United States have a very long standing uh, relationship uh, as well. Uh, before Biden's, uh, Southeast Asia has always experienced a so called up and down in the US engagement in the region. Uh, Obama basically, uh, we, I think, is the most uh, Southeast Asia friendly uh, president, so to speak. Uh, he has some roots in Indonesia, of course. Uh, uh, and then he did visit, I think, uh, more than uh, eight or nine uh, Southeast Asian countries, the most uh, by uh, among all the American presidents. So in this, uh, he was a very uh, a president that uh, had a lot of uh, uh, interactions with Southeast Asia where he is appreciated in this uh, region. Uh, but then we also saw how that was completely reversed or almost completely uh, reversed under uh, Trump. Right? Trump, I don't think he really cared about Southeast Asia much. Uh, he has some good uh, he established some good rapports uh, in the region, I think, uh, with uh, certain uh, certain leaders or certain uh, politicians. But otherwise, uh, he was basically not much interested in what Southeast Asia uh, <coughs> could offer to him. Uh, I think uh, the current administration uh, is more or less in between the two. Uh, Biden, I don't think he is as engaging as uh, President Obama. Uh, we could already see that he skipped one of the uh, major uh, ASEAN in, uh, summits. Uh, uh, and I think Obama would, uh, would pay much more attention to that to that kind of face-to-face uh, -face engagement. Uh, but of course, uh, Biden was a vast improvement uh, of, from uh, Trump as well, uh, as uh, from the standpoint of this uh, region. Uh, Southeast Asia, of course, is... Uh, very crucial count in the age of the so-called Indo-Pacific. Uh, it's almost geographically speaking, is the in the middle of it. It's a key front of the technological rivalry. Uh, uh, part of the so ongoing efforts uh, to reshape these regional and global supply chains, uh, the so-called de-risking, right? Decoupling, de-risking. These are the different terms. Uh, um, basically, the idea was to create uh, an alternative uh, supply chain outside of China and Southeast Asian countries basically uh, were or are being uh, designated as a lot of uh, this, uh, su re this su supply chain uh, reshoring uh, would, uh, would be put and would be placed at. Right? So this is a major uh, region as well. Um, and the Biden administration, uh, I think to their credits have decided on a much more concerted and integrated approach, uh, basically integrating the economic security, people to people, and the multilater multilateralism components uh, in, in engaging Southeast Asia. Uh, next slide. So um, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States, uh, basically the major document of the Biden uh, administration has, 19 mentions of uh, ASEAN, uh, six mentions of specific ASEAN countries. Uh, four of them basically uh, did not uh, have any mention. Basically, uh, the US is very clear that they prior prioritize uh, certain countries more than the others. Uh, and then it is, I'm just reading the quote out of this uh, uh, document, the United States also welcomes a strong and independent ASEAN that leads in Southeast Asia. We endorse ASEAN centrality and support ASEAN in its efforts to deliver sustainable solutions to the region's most pressing challenges. Uh, of course, referring to China as one of the most pressing challenges uh, as well. And to that end, we will deepen long-standing cooperation with ASEAN while launching new high-level 
engagement on health, climate and environment, uh, energy transportation and gender equity and equality. We will work with ASEAN to build its resilience as a leading regional institution and will explore opportunities for our, for the court to work with uh, ASEAN. Right. I think the following passage uh, after this paragraph will uh, the document actually also suggests their uh, how the United States will push for South Asian countries, basically uh, referring to uh, India, uh, to work with uh, ASEAN as well. Basically, try to create a co coalition is a very uh, us versus them kind of terms, but I think in this sense, it's very clear that it's trying to create more and more uh, countries under uh, a, a grand grouping, but China stand outside of this grouping, all right? Uh, more and more a united front kind of a uh, united... Uh, well, United Front is a Chinese Communist Party term, but in this sense, it's applicable in the sense that it's trying to create a grand unity uh, of countries uh, that uh, where China is actually not part of it. Um, so the, there is a US ASEAN Special Summit, uh, May 2002, uh, Comprehensive Strategic Partnership that was just uh, launched uh, last year. It's almost a one year anniversary now. Uh, and then uh, have allocated more uh, financial assistance to Southeast Asian countries, a number of uh, a number of uh, initiatives, uh, digital infrastructure, health, and so on and so forth. I think the U.S. did uh, basically undertake actions uh, that were mentioned in the document, so they were fulfilling the kind of uh, promises uh, they made uh, in terms of engaging with ASEAN. Um, so. Basically, the last uh, item on this uh, page, uh, there is this fact sheets uh, where the State Departments uh, put together the things that have been done in the past year. Of course, uh, publicity, so we have to uh, look at whether uh, they are implemented in a way that they advertise themselves uh, to be very effective or not. Uh, but I think there were a number of things that have, uh, have been undertaken in the past year or so in a way that increased uh, the linkages and engagements between the U.S. and the countries in Southeast Asia. However, it's also very clear that the U.S. Uh, is only uh, is prioritizing, I would say, uh, certain countries much, much more than the others. Uh, the Philippines and Vietnam definitely receive a much greater share of U.S. attention uh, compared to others. Indonesia, I think, continue would be strongly uh, engaged by the uh, by the United States uh, uh, for the fact that it is uh, it is the largest uh, country in Southeast Asia. Singapore also one of these uh, long standing partners. Uh, but others, uh, for example, Malaysia. I think the U.S. efforts uh, uh, are quite uh, minimal compared to their relationship with the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, I think Thailand, in a way, also doesn't fare uh, much better compared. I mean, in, with Malaysia as well, uh, and then the rest of our ASEAN countries basically is uh, more or less outside of our uh, US uh, radar, right, or scope of engagement. So it's very very selective. You only work with those countries that you feel um has certain value that you could add in terms of the grand scheme of competition uh, with China. Malaysia is a very very neutral in a way countries uh, among the ASEAN countries so um, in that sense uh, it, it, it may not be very well received uh, by certain uh, policy makers uh, within the United States. Uh, next slide please. Right so just to show you uh, the uh, pictures uh, that was taken uh, in May 2022 right uh, ASEAN countries leaders basically flew to uh, flew to uh, Washington uh, to have this special summit. Uh, of course, Myanmar uh, already had the coup, right? so so the junta basically was not represented uh, in this uh, in this photo. Uh, next slide. Uh, comprehensive strategic partnership between Vietnam and the United States uh, just announced a couple of months ago. Uh, and Vietnam is a very interesting case uh, countries, uh, I would say, uh, in the region right now. Um, it is uh, simultaneously uh, upgrading their relationship with China and the United States at the same time. I think Vietnam has, get, has been getting a lot of this uh, uh, support and attention, and they have, they have been leveraging uh, this uh, dynamic uh, very well. 
Uh, so at the same time that uh, it upgraded this relationship, uh, there are uh, issue, I think, a joint statement with uh, with China as well, uh, with, with the foreign ministers. And it is expected that uh, one of the, uh, well, I think one of the meetings that China undertook, uh, Xi Jinping undertook uh, after they started to open up their borders uh, actually was uh, with uh, Vietnam leader. And I think also upcoming, uh, very likely one of the foreign visits that Xi Jinping will undertake uh, will also be to Vietnam, right? So Vietnam is uh, currently enjoying the best uh, that both sides uh, uh, can offer. Right. It's very interesting, uh, this, uh, this uh, phenomenon. Um, next page. Um, so this is another country that has been strongly uh, favored by the United States uh, in its approaches, uh, in its uh, engagement approaches to Southeast Asia, uh, the Philippines. Uh, but Philippines relationship with China is basically at a one, I wouldn't say the lowest, uh, but definitely uh, much worse uh, than uh, than the early part of the year. Uh, and then and because of uh, that, uh, the Philippines is tightening its uh, alliance relationship uh, with the United States as well. It's very unusual for a president uh, to visit the Indo-Pacific Command in Hawaii. Uh, that just happened uh, last month. Right, uh, by uh, President Marcos Jr. of the Philippines. Right. Uh, next page. Yeah. Um, China Southeast Asia relations. Um, how do we describe it? <laughs> um, I put the title as steady progress uh, amidst strategic uncertainties. Uh, definitely there were a lot of uncertainties. Definitely, there is also steady progress, right? So it is a bit of a, uh, um, I would say contradictory trends. Uh, but I think it's progress amidst a lot of uh, anxieties. Uh, from I think more likely from the Southeast Asian countries towards China rather than the other way around. But there were concerns from uh China as well uh, as to the directions of, uh, of the strategic. And China basically back in early 2000s, uh, they have almost 10 years of very good uh, developments of relationship. Uh, but then starting uh, in 2010s, right, that I think was the time period where the South China Sea issue had become much more uh, pronounced uh, in the bilateral relationship with certain uh, ASEAN member states. Um. Uh. The the overall China ASEAN ties have become much more um defined by this cooperation, but also with a lot of anxieties. I think a, a decade earlier, you see a less of those kind of anxieties compared to the uh, second decade of the twenty first century. Uh. So that is how we are just entering the 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 third decade. Uh, and uh, uh, there is therefore there is still steady progress uh, in a way that we had a strategic uh, comprehensive strategic partnership uh, between China and ASEAN so making you know, basically uh, uh, China and the US uh, almost at the same level uh, and the engagement is still very extensive in the sense that uh, this year alone this year Nine leaders of ASEAN countries already visited China twice. Um, I counted uh, some uh, even twice, uh, including Cambodia, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia. Uh, I think Brunei, uh, Brunei Sultan uh, is the only one that hasn't really visited uh, China this year. Uh, of course, not every visit turned out to pave the way for a stronger relationship. The classic Example would be uh, the Philippines, right? Uh, that basically after the visit in January, uh, by President Marcos Jr. Uh, but a few months later, uh, the relationship took a no dive. Uh, but that was uh, the the case of the Philippines could be somewhat of an exception. Uh, I think all the other countries basically uh continue to have a steady, uh, if not very positive relationship with China, um, uh, and the main foundation of China-ASEAN relations is still 
economic ties. Uh, Southeast Asia basically now is more and more uh, enveloped, I will say, into the economic orbit uh, that uh, that China is the very much uh, center of it. Uh, of course, there are various uh, economic, major regional uh, economic trade deals, uh, including uh, Af CAFTA, uh, China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. The 2.0 version is ongoing, they are negotiating the 3.0. Uh, there are some issues that need to be resolved, but already they paved a way for <coughs> the trade relationship to flourish, uh, regional comprehensive economic partnership, uh, bear and road initiative projects, a number of them have already completed and operational, uh, including in Malaysia, uh, East Coast Rail Link is about uh, close to 60% complete. Uh, the Bandang Jakarta High Speed Rail, I would learn from our Indonesian audience uh, what is the uh, state of uh, uh, of this uh, project uh, as of now right so um, and right now more than just the old diplomatic lexicon comprehensive strategic partnership which has been basically used by a lot of countries um, and uh, Malaysia also has this partnership with this and that country and so on and so forth and now there is a new term which simply indicates an even higher level. It's very interesting, the community of shared future or community with uh, shared future. Of course, it's just a term. It doesn't signify uh, things that, that, it doesn't signify any concrete policy um, uh, measures, but it does indicate some kind of uh, acceptance or consensus. I think that is uh, still quite important. And six, out of uh, 10 ASEAN countries have already accepted uh, these terms, uh, if not endorsed it. And it is likely uh, Vietnam, I what I heard or what I learned from uh, my counterparts and friends in Vietnam that they are actually uh, very actively discussing uh, this prospect of Vietnam also accepting this, uh, this term. But whether it will, of course, uh, nobody knows for sure. There may be some kind of resistance uh, because there is also the kind of uh, conception or kind of feeling that uh, it, China is very imposing in wanting other countries uh, just to accept this. And sometimes countries just defer to China's uh, imposing demands rather than really willingly uh, endorse uh, this term. Anyway, uh, it represents the kind of diplomatic uh, scores that China managed to get uh, out of ASEAN. Uh, so many countries are willing to accept these terms. And below at the ASEAN level, these this, uh, various uh, sub-regional engagement, the Lanchang Mekong cooperation is uh, quite productive and you know, with a lot of mechanisms and meetings and uh, structure that have been put in place. Uh, another one is the less known China uh, Bim Yaga cooperation, the Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and East ASEAN growth area uh, cooperation. Uh, that uh, is progressing at a much slower level, uh, both sides. Um, but I think more actually from the uh, ASEAN, the Bim Yaga side, uh, the, the the efforts put in put into it uh, is are not very forthcoming in a way. Uh, but China remain one of the uh, partners of Bim Yaga, officially speaking, right? There, are also, there is also Japan and maybe in the future, uh, uh, Korea as well. Uh, but China remain one of the major partners of this Bim Yaga. Um, next slide, please. Right, so um, ASEAN has already surpassed both the European Union and the United States to become the largest trade partner of uh, China. That happened around 2020. It's actually very significant. Uh, China's open and reform, the reform and opening up and the major foreign uh, economic partners has always been the developed countries. Uh, it is the first time that China also uh, experience uh, this fundamental monumental change where ASEAN now actually has become the largest uh, trade uh, partner. Uh, next slide. And of course, uh, correspondingly, uh, China has been ASEAN largest trade partners at least for uh, for more than 10 years already, All right. at least in the case of Malaysia, but I'm sure it's almost the same case for uh, every uh, ASEAN countries. I think maybe there are one or two that is uh, that's still doesn't count China as the largest trade partner, but vast majority uh, we do. Right. 
Um, next next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, this is kind of the uh breakdown of the uh, number of ASEAN the the breakdown of the ASEAN countries trade volume uh with China uh in twenty twenty. Uh, Vietnam is uh, already ahead uh, with, uh, with the rest of the ASEAN countries, but others are also uh, not too far behind. Uh, next. Um, the good economic relationship uh, doesn't really translate into stable strategic ties. Uh, South China Sea continue to be the major issue occupying uh, a lot of maritime countries' concerns uh, with China. I think on the continental part, uh, the so-called Mekong countries, uh, Laos, Cambodia, uh, Vietnam also included, uh, Thailand and Myanmar, there is, uh, uh, there, there, there is the kind of uh, somewhat similar dynamic concerning the Mekong River. Uh, there were some... Uh, I wouldn't say efforts, but well, attempts to securitize the Mekong River issue uh, in a way that uh, it become another major uh, security uh, concerns. But for what I can gather with uh, my counterparts, you know, discussions uh, with uh, Mekong countries, uh, academics and scholars and think tanks, actually the 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 kind of uh, the kind of anxieties are very different from South China Sea issues. Uh, the Mekong River is still, I think, in a way, can be uh, managed and resolved through a lot more management, technical cooperation. is is something that is strategic and political, but it's also something that is technical. Basically, they are very concerned whether China control the water flow in a way that affect the downstream and so on and so forth. And these kind of issues can be slowly, slowly addressed and and trust to be built up, and then both sides find a way to basically uh, have an agreement on this one. Uh, and it's not always the case that, that China uh, will be able to impose its own uh, ideas on the low stream countries. There's, in the sense that the Mekong issue, I wouldn't say is as strategically um, creating the anxiety as the South China Sea uh, mm -hmm. issue. And for the very simple uh, fact that South China Sea concerns territorial and sovereignty and sovereign rights, right? territorial and maritime uh, claims. It is a very, very complicated uh, dispute, one of the most, uh, if not the most complicated disputes uh, in, in the world. Uh, and then for that, it continued to undermine uh, the relationship uh, between uh, China and at least some of the Southeast Asian countries, as we can see under uh, uh with the Philippines at the moment, uh, Vietnam and Malaysia right now, uh, I will say are at the relative stable level. Both sides seem to find a kind of a balance between asserting their own national interests and rights, but uh, not escalating uh, their disputes uh, with uh, with the with the other side, uh, and we actually. Uh, between China, Malaysia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand, even had just had a, a military exercise uh, together in uh, China. Of course, there is more symbolic uh, rather than a very substantive kind of exercise, but it does show that uh, that we are not uh, going to allow the disputes to escalate to the situation where we uh, see each other as the major adversaries. Uh, so, um, the major means to control or manage this issue is still the codes, uh, Code of Conduct Negotiations, uh, which has been basically taking place for about 20 years already now in going to the third reading. I have relatively pessimistic assessment of when it can be concluded. I think the differences are still quite huge, uh, but we'll see. And we'll be happy to uh, engage on these issues uh, in the, in the Q&A discussions uh, later. Uh, next slide. All right, so this is the uh, six countries uh, exercise, right? Aman Yoyi, uh, 2023. All right, so uh, very interesting uh, multilateral exercise involving China and five ASEAN countries. Uh, it started with as a China Malaysia bilateral uh, exercise uh, back in 2014, and then it was held 1516 and 18 with the participation of Thailand, uh, and then 2023 uh, with the participation of another. 
uh, three more countries, uh, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So uh, this uh, bilateral, going to trilateral, and going to a more multilateral uh, exercise. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Uh, I think this uh my final two slides. Uh, Southeast Asia or ASEAN. Uh, how do we position ourselves uh amidst this uh competition between the U.S. and China? Um, I think there are different domains and dimensions. Rather than taking the strategic competition as a as a whole, um, perhaps it will benefit a bit more to disaggregate. Uh, the competition into different domains and dimensions and see what uh, Southeast Asian countries and ASEAN uh, position itself. I think in terms of economics, trade, technology, right, where you see these terms, uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Framework, IPEF, BRI, RCEP, supply chain, de-risking, uh, you know, all these uh, vocabularies or terminologies are basically associated with this uh, front or this domain of uh, competition, economic trades and technology. Southeast Asia probably can position ourselves as a buffer and a connecting zone. Uh, it is through Southeast Asia that US and China can continue to trade to, with each other in a way that uh, does not result in a complete breakdown of their economic ties. Um, I think one of the reasons why ASEAN trade with China have gone up because we have become the intermediaries uh, for some of China's exports to escape from US tariff and uh, export through our region and then go to the United States. Right. I, I think both sides understand that uh, this is taking place in a way that may not be the uh, um, escaping from the tariffs and things like that may not be actually what the policy Makers like, but this is kind of the temporary buffer uh, and connecting zone that uh, both sides also feel is uh, necessary in order to make the in order to stabilize their economic uh, competition. I think it will be the same uh, in other areas of economic and trade tensions where Southeast Asia increasingly will be where both sides can meet uh, uh, in the middle ground, right, as a buffer and a connecting zone, right, if they. Uh, However, however, this is uh this is not necessarily definitely going to be the case, uh, especially from the US side, they become more and more sharper uh in reducing certain ambiguities of what how they want to do business with China. And if they continue to reduce that ambiguities, I think the role of Southeast Asia as a buffer in a connecting zone will also be reduce right and that is not necessary i think good for the uh, economic prospect of the region another dimensions of the competitions uh, have to do have to do with this uh, so called values governance and narratives uh, us always like to create a very grand or even epic uh, story in a sense that this is a democracy versus autocracy this is the kind of the epic struggle between good and Evil, right? Kind of a a, a Marvel's uh, uh kind of a, a narrative. Uh, then recently there is this new Washington consensus, uh, articulated by uh, by Sullivan, right? And then uh, with China also come up with its own narrative of China style modernization. Uh, and then basically imploring other countries uh, that you accept my values and narratives, uh, you're on our side, good side. Right? The other side basically is the dark side. Right? Uh, more, more in the case of the US rather than China, I think. Uh, but on, think on this ground, Southeast Asia doesn't really care about whose side is uh, angel and whose side is evil. I think Southeast Asia is rather very plural, neutral, open-ended ground. It will be very, very pragmatic. Uh, China's can offer things that we can learn, US can offer things that we can learn. It doesn't have to be a very uh, binary black and white uh, situation on this narrative values and governance ground. On international norms and rules, right? this is one thing that the US has always uh, uh, argued that China is, uh, is a revisionist power, is not following uh, international norms and rules. And I think uh, with... <clears throat> Quite a number of uh, amount of truth uh, in this uh, in these uh, accusations as well. 
but the but China also at the same time has also offered the kind of argument that the U.S. so-called rule-based order is a very uh a, a created and perpetrated by the West. It doesn't have the consensus of all the countries in the world. Uh, what the all the countries in the world that have agreement to is actually a UN-based order, which is slightly different from what the U.S. so-called liberal order uh, has. And the liberal order basically uh, does not take into account of the voices and the interests of the developing countries. Uh, and then the usual examples point to are the global economic governance frameworks, right? The, the IMF or World Bank, which have always uh, continued to be dominated by the Western countries in their leadership. Right? So um, the international order needs to be reformed to take into account of the interests of the global South. I think on this one, Southeast Asia is an ambiguous block. I think we agree a lot with China on some of the things that it says about the perpetuity of the Western interests in certain aspects of the current order that need to be replaced. But on the other hand, we also quite see the point of where China sometimes could be uh, quite revisionist or quite different from other countries in terms of understanding what uh, basic standard international law is about. In particular, I think uh, for those countries in the maritime zone, right, the maritime international law uh, is where the differences are, are quite prevalent. Um, and then finally, on the strategic and security issues, Southeast Asia, on the one hand, is a direct stakeholder, especially for uh, claimant states in the South China Sea. But I think uh, it can be a moderating force between the US and China. Uh, it can stand as a middle ground where both sides uh, can know that the more that the competition polarizes the world, the more that it is disadvantageous for everybody. And then I think Southeast Asia can step in and commit to ensure that the competition wouldn't go to the very, very polarized uh, direction. <clears throat> uh, so this is one of the things that uh, Southeast Asia probably uh, can exercise certain uh, force as a, a moderating force. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the strategic advantages of ASEAN. I think ASEAN, Southeast Asia, ASEAN, right? Uh, of course, we still have uh, Timor Leste not being ASEAN yet, uh, but uh, I think we should have uh, Timor uh, Leste as well. But any, oh, before that, I think ASEAN is a super connector. Um, we have we are of course very familiar with the ASEAN-based multilateralism, regional architecture, uh, is very inclusive. If it, if you come to think about it, neither the European Union or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, these are outside of ASEAN. I think these are the two other major regional organizations in in the world, right? They are very kind of functional and effective. Um, but uh, I think none of them can compare with ASEAN in terms of the kind of connecting role that ASEAN. Uh, has successfully uh, played. Uh, ASEAN is also very credible as a platform for engagement. As in China and Japan and Russia. EU, you don't see that in SCO, you don't see that in other regional organizations. Right? So that continue to be a strategic advantages. And if there is any, um, I think, initiatives that I, ASEAN probably can take. Uh, I would suggest maybe uh, can think about an ASEAN plus two, ASEAN, US and China special summit. Uh, I don't know whether this is realistic or not. This is something that I have thought, I mean, uh, just for fun, whether that can take place or not. Uh, but ASEAN has been able to put under uh, China, Japan, Korea in the ASEAN plus three, right? And China, Japan, Korea basically, um, also do not always have good relationship, especially between China and Japan, and also for some time, Japan and Korea, uh, but they can meet and engage each, each other effectively, right, through ASEAN, uh, under the ASEAN plus three. Uh, so in that case, uh, there is some kind of a uh, precedence, uh, and maybe ASEAN, uh, if we stay stronger together and become a very effective voice, uh, that could allow uh, ASEAN to play a more important role uh, in, in engaging both uh, powers. But of course, we have to recognize that uh, 
the current moment, ASEAN is actually not doing very well. Uh, there is increased polarization within ASEAN. Some countries, more China aligned is very clear, and some also become much more US aligned, right? Um, it's unbalanced economic growth. Some like Myanmar is basically uh, well, Myanmar. The last point is the Myanmar issue that ASEAN has not been able to deal with. But if ASEAN continue to have among its member states continue to have unbalanced economic growth, it will only create the uh, tendency to each country take care of its own uh, narrow interest rather than for the common interest of the whole uh, grouping. All right, I think I will stop here. Uh, I look forward to the questions and answer uh, questions uh, from the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cho. It's really, really uh, enlightening us on the issue of the ASEAN and China relation, especially with America. As you said, it's three trilateral relationship between uh, three countries. But uh, I want to add something that my talk that I really, really agree with your uh, perspective about how China policy is really, really abstract in Southeast Asian country, like Community of Shared Future and Belt and Road Initiative. I'm from Indonesia. My thesis in China is about talking is talking about the Belt and Road Initiative in Indonesia. Uh, there is still a difference between, different perspective between China side and Indonesian side, which project or which policy that including in Belt and Road Initiative. This, this makes that there is no particular communication about how policy, how China policy work in Southeast Asian country, like as you say before. So it's really, really enlightening us on this issue. So I will open the floor for any question from the participant. So if the participant want to ask a question directly or in chat, please share your moment, uh, please your question in here. Okay. There is a question, sir, from my student, Alip Albiansa. Uh, uh, you want to rest, take a rest first? Uh, or is... we can continue? Yeah, continue, continue. Uh, let me oh, just okay. take a look. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the question from Alip Albiansa is yeah. like, how does ASEAN maintain the balance when the member states tend to position themselves toward one country, like for US or China itself? How... How how does ASEAN maintain it? Um, it's actually a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> um, I think it's a, a a very paradoxical, um, somewhat somewhat paradoxical effect, in the sense that uh, it is because that there is a, I will I will argue is because there is an ASEAN, countries can engage either side, the US or China, at a more comfortable level, knowing that uh, there is a regional uh, grouping uh, where we can fall back to, right? If uh, you know, if there's something that is, uh, well, I don't know, like something that is uncontrollable and things like that. So uh, therefore, I think being a member of ASEAN in a way actually creates uh, the rooms for countries to engage uh, each side. Uh, and uh, in and in the engagement, I think all ASEAN countries generally want to get the benefits out of both sides. Uh, but it sometimes is whether the other sides, uh, China and ASEAN, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, China and the United States, uh, in are incentivized to uh, reciprocate the kind of uh engagement uh that uh these ASEAN countries uh want to uh want to follow or want to maintain. So. Therefore, even though is the question is about how we try to do that, but sometimes the question is also about how did we are being reciprocated by the other side. And on this one, I will say that uh, the US is very clear. Um, it prioritizes certain countries and it will react strongly, but sometimes not as strong as some other countries. Like for example, I would say Malaysia uh, somehow is outside of the priorities areas. Uh, whereas for China, of course, China does have its own set of prior priority countries as well. But overall speaking, unless countries become very, the relationship become very, very, uh, uh, very, very tense, like the Philippines, China tend to be much more willing to engage in countries that are even not 
within their prior release areas. Um, I'm saying in a general sense, uh, but of course there are some uh, differences uh, here and there as well. Right. Okay. There's any other question? Uh, Alip, want to continue with the answer from Dr. Cho? Okay, uh, because it will be continue uh, your uh, presentation before about the code of conduct. Many, many Indonesian and international relations scholars in here also criticism Indonesian leadership in ASEAN before because on the submit, uh, Indonesian can cannot push the code of conduct in China. Uh, and I think if the Indonesia cannot push it uh, in submit level, also other country in ASEAN. Why, what do you think about why ASEAN failed to push code of conduct in their submit regarding with China? If you, if you are saying about putting it as a way of concluding it, I don't think it matters whether it is Indonesia or Laos or whichever countries. I think Indonesia can make the, um, can accelerate you no, know, can create the platform where a lot more sessions of discussions can be arranged and things like that. However, the conclusion of the negotiation is that it has to be accepted by each and every country of the negotiating party. So it's not up to Indonesia to say that it can be successfully concluded in this summit or that summit. That depends on the whether the differences can be reduced. Therefore, it's not a particular country's push, then therefore it can be done. It's not going to be like that. And the differences between the countries, um, primarily between China and certain ASEAN countries, uh, but differences also exist within ASEAN countries. And we have to remember this one. It is a code for conduct for every uh, stakeholders there, right? of course, not including countries out of the region, but each and every one. So there are a lot of viewpoints there. It's not easy to come to a conclusion. So mm, I, I, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, there is another question from Mr. Prado Nibudusa Putro. He want to ask a question directly. So for the Mr. Prado, no, the time is yours. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Ngau Chobing. It's, uh, it's such an honor to have you here as a guest lecturer in our university. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Uh, currently, China is uh, developing its artificial intelligence technology for its military needs. Uh, the United States and its allies, of course, will certainly do, th do the same. Will this competition between China and the United States in artificial intelligence technology lead to an artificial intelligence arms race in the Indo-Pacific? If the answer is yes, how should ASEAN respond to maintain the regional stability in Indo-Pacific? Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that uh, applications of artificial intelligence in military, um, I may not be in the best position to offer a very uh, complete answer, but what I understand is that in the recent summit, uh, one of the areas where both sides have agreed to talk to is about artificial intelligence. And for what I understand that uh, they have basically in mind is exactly the application of this AI in military. Um, it is basically an unknown trajectory if this is going to be much more widely applicable. And the outcome of it is, is going to be quite uh, destabilizing. So to answer your questions, I think in a short, I think in a uh, at least in the short term, um, both sides have agreed not to extend this uh, artificial intelligence arms competition. Uh, we can quite uh, feel that there is not going to happen, at least in the short term. 
if that is going to happen, I really don't know in a sense that not many countries have that kind of capabilities to do. I think only US, China, Europe, maybe Japan and some other countries. ASEAN is of course full of potential and energy, but it is not at the same level in terms of uh, developing some kind of these, uh, um, these things. Right? Uh, <laughs> so that is my answer. I hope that they will divert the AI competition to more commercial applications. I think that will be fine and that will benefit a lot more us as well uh, rather than to military uh, competition. Thanks. Okay. okay, thank you, Dr. Chow. Okay, oh. there's another question, sir. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is uh, because of uh, Indonesian uh, route of foreign policy uh, is bad, is active and free. There is a tendency in Indonesian foreign policy to more rely on the one set in in this case is china because of indonesian dependent on china economy uh what do you think about this uh situation because this situation also happened like your like what you said before happened to another country that really really depend their economy on china how indonesian or other countries manage this situation i think it is inevitable in a way that countries develop close relationship, or in this case, people like to use the term dependent on other countries uh, for economic development. Um, but that does that signify a complete dependence on dominance? It could be, but I think the very more important is that you use that period of economic development, cooperation or whatever, to build your own internal strengths. If we look at US-China relationship, it is also actually an even more drastic case of China's dependence on the US in terms of trade, market access, investment, technology. But China never really say that, oh, we are dependent on the US, we are therefore beholden by the to the US or whatever. It used this opportunity to build its own strengths of course, it's also a mutually beneficial relationship in a way of the, that that should be recognized, right? The U.S. also gain out of it, the Chinese also gain out of it, and it's not predetermined that both sides will come to today's uh, situation. But uh, but my point is that when we talk about this kind of situation, is that it's fine for us to work with one country or the other country more. But the more important thing is that we use this opportunity so that we don't feel that it will be completely dominated in the future by this uh, particular uh, superpower in this case. So by all means, uh, I think economic engagements, when it benefits the country, still can con uh, continue to do it, build up their own strengths, right? rather than being feared that it will be uh, dominated uh, in the future. Okay, uh, this is another question, sir, from Pilar. Uh, he asked a question about what your opinion about ASEAN respond when dualism of power occurs between Indonesia, uh, between America's uh, US and China in the regional cooperation? I mean, uh, he mean this cooperation between the two countries in toward the US or China or the ASEAN need to more active if the competition between in this region or ASEAN is still being neutral doesn't make any initiative or policy regarding the competition. Oh, all right. If if the if I understand the question correctly, I'm not sure whether I understand correctly, but I think if the, if the question is whether ASEAN should abandon its neutral policy and then uh take one side or the other, is that what the question basically suggests? Uh, or? uh the not, not question really. is. Yeah, not really. I think the main question is about uh, when the competition happened in this region, uh -huh. uh, the dualism of power between China and uh, US will will influence the cooperation in this region. So who will uh, ASEAN or particular need to cite or policy that they want to develop or introduce? to maintain this situation. All right. Because like okay. when 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 America when US or China involved 
the ASEAN just like influenced not really really being centered of the policy itself. I have no probably good answers to that uh, questions. I think this is grappling in the heads of many policymakers uh, in the capitals of ASEAN. Probably some have already decided that if the United States pressure us, uh, we will just uh, defer to them. Or if China pressure, they will defer to them. But I think that really contingent upon how much pressure that both sides uh, wanted to um, exercise. Uh, I think ASEAN coming out of the ASEAN outlook of the Indo-Pacific was a good example of how we try to redefine the role of ASEAN so that we would define ourselves in the age of Indo-Pacific what we want to do rather than we are being defined by the US document or by China's document what Indo-Pacific means to ASEAN. If we continue to be defined by them, then, then we will play their role. But I think A AOIP is an example where we come up with our own vision and now the US and, and China came to say that and other countries came to say that, oh, your AOIP document is very good. We endorse you and so on and so forth, at least at the rhetorical level. I think that is one example. Um, I think we could, if we uh, leverage our uh, strengths in a more clever way, uh, we could ask them to comply to some of our regulation, you know, some of our requests and regulations and demands rather than we are being asked to comply with them. But again, that depends on how much <laughs> strength we really have. <laughs> again, I'm sorry, I there's no real, real good question, good answers to the, to the, to the good questions. I think it's only bad answers from me. <laughs> <laughs> like it's really, really attracted us because the complexity between ASEAN and China is we think it's really, really defined how this region will be fucking apart for the 10 year or 20 year in the future. Because the competition already in here in our home, but our home is doesn't know what initiative want we to do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there another question from the participant in here. Yeah, I, I... Uh, because there is no other question. Um, I think I will be oh. the last question in this seminar from you. It's really, really uh to fulfill my curiosity. I'm sorry <laughs> because no, I really, no really interested between ASEAN and China, like. China no has a really, really massive problem with the, their communication policy. Like like you said, that community of shared culture is still abstract concept. There is no significant policy in, in the document. So how ASEAN country need to perceive this document or this abstract concept when they want to implement to their country? Or this is... China need to improve their communication or ASEAN need to more sensitive with the China? Mm. Good questions. Uh, actually, I'm very ambivalent about this community of shared future. <laughs> not in the sense that I disagree with it. It's just that whether it is necessary or not. Um, I think at this moment, sometimes it will create a lot more misunderstanding rather than rather than understanding, in a way. Um, if countries sign up or agree with this term, does it mean that we are now on the China side or what? And if we don't sign up, would China feel therefore not very happy about it that you are not, you don't agree with our vision and therefore somehow our circles have become a bit more distant from you? No, that actually create some kind of uh, choices that countries have to make that is somewhat actually unnecessary because we can continue to cooperate in many things that we want with or without the community of common destiny term that is being applied actually <laughs> so so i actually am somewhat uh ambivalent on this one but on the other hand, I kind of understand that China feel that it has to tell the world what it wants. The US is very clear. 
right? I want liberal international order and things like that. You like it, you join, you don't like it, well, well good luck to you. Or not good luck to you, good luck to you. <laughs> right? But I know I think China being a rising superpower and uh, a very different culture and a very different political system, it feel that it has to convince the world that uh, its vision is good, it's not threatening and so on and so forth. But I, I think that is something that they have to do, but it's not very effective, a little bit clumsy. That concept is too abstract and uh, it's not as easily, easily, um, it, it doesn't easily make sense right, to many people. So again, I don't have good answers to your good questions. Perhaps I'm just asking a lot more questions. But I think <laughs> you are talking about China's communications power, so to speak, or China's communications capabilities. I think China will still have a long way to learn. Um, first, it is very late into this game. The US is a superpower for so long and it knows how to communicate very effectively um, through whatever means. And it's not just the government, it's the private sector, it's the civil society, it's the media, and so on and so forth. Um, and China being a much more state-dominated uh, polity, all right, it doesn't have that kind of uh, dynamism and energy in its civil society. It, it has, but it is restricted. And that, therefore, people feel that uh, the China's uh, messages are always very official, official dom is, 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 is not helping. But also very crucially, I think that is something that we have to realize is that it, this is somewhat to China's disadvantage that English, you know, the language that we are using here, is international language and US is a English country. So in that sense, US is a very complete transparent country. Transparent not in terms of their policies, but transparent in the sense that everybody can understand and read whatever coming from the US is full of transparency of people observing the US in that sense. The China, many people feel very difficult to understand. It is culturally, linguistically, and politically very different. And the, the more that China tries to explain, and sometimes it will not necessarily get the messages out in a very effective way. So I think you still have a very, very long way uh, to go. Uh, again, it's a long-winded, okay. bad answer to your good questions. <laughs> <laughs> because like in China, is they lost the bad and good initiative in Indonesia, but in Indonesia, it's a, the, government, the government said it also didn't agree, fully agree with what but as an initiative actually that is really really interesting. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir, because there is another question. I think oh, no problem. No from problem. the uh from the participant uh, participant like from Gizem Butun, uh he asked about question about how ASEAN can be more effective within member individual individual tendency to US or China because like ASEAN here to serve the member how ASEAN be more effective to the member. Toward this issue. I think to be effective, and that is my view, of course, I come from Malaysia. I, there is certain bias in me, but I think to be effective, we have to be not aligned. Mm -hmm. This is my view. I think friends in the Philippines probably disagree, or maybe from others, but I think perhaps Indonesia will agree a bit more is that um there is a purpose and there is certain efficacy in a non-alignment and neutrality. Uh, because if you completely become uh, an ally or whatever on, to one side or the other, it comes with the, I think it comes with certain loss opportunities for uh, moderating the behavior of the other side. right? In the sense that if I side with the US completely in a sense then, I lose the opportunity to play the role of bridge between the US and China and therefore reducing the tension. And then whatever we do, we will be interpreted by China side as an extension of the US. It's the same thing if we do anything completely, then it will be interpreted by the other side as that we are the extension of the other party. Somewhat very unfortunately, once we become completely the other, you no, know, falling for one side or the other, countries assume that we lose so-called agency is a term that is being used very frequently. But like it or not, that is exactly the how perceptions are being shaped. I think because we are neutral, we can engage either positively or with disagreements. 
with certain credibility. Um, so I think that is still the most effective way uh, to deal with uh, either US and China. Right? We will agree with US when it is uh, something that we agree, just agree. Right? Doesn't mean that we are your ally. Same thing with China. <laughs> right? If you disagree, disagree. Doesn't mean that I'm against you. I think this is how Malaysia has been able to deal with China on the South China Sea issue. In one way, of course, there are many other factors. and doesn't mean that we are doing very well. Uh, you know, but I think that reduced tensions because China doesn't see Malaysia as an extension of the US. Right? So that is something that uh, that how I would I, I, how I would suggest uh, to be continually effectively uh, engaged with both sides. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really, really interesting, sir, because like American has a tendency also when he make a relation with Southeast Asian country, they want to use it not as benefit of the Southeast Asian country, but for, but for the benefit of the Americans. So that's make uh, China has misinterpretation also with this policy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so alignment in that way create a lot of uh, alliance or whatever. It create a lot of this misunderstanding and perception that accelerated, you know, the <laughs> further distort certain realities on the ground. Okay, okay. Uh, uh Faisal, gimana? Mau dilanjutin atau gimana, Faisal? Uh, itu masih ada salah satu pertanyaan sih, Mas. Oh, There's masih ada. One question from Mr. Berlin Citorus. Oh, Berlin Citorus. Oh, Berlin. Uh, di aku nggak muncul pertanyaannya. Oh iya, Pak. Sebentar. Yeah. Uh, there is another question, sir, but it yeah. through the admin. So okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the question is, what kind of effort can be applied to ASEAN country to balance power in terms of economic strength and national stability with countries that are already developed economically and have national stability? What kind of efforts can be applied to ASEAN countries to balance power? I think it is in the term between like when you are leaning on economic strength, you will be more rely on China. But if you want to be uh, rely on national stability, you are more rely on American side. How to balance the situation between economic side and uh, national side? Because when you are like have economic dependence on China, like you said, the national st uh, the national stability is really really decreased like in indonesia itself how to balance it i think the question is toward that term i think <laughs> <laughs> um i think we have to go beyond just looking at uh, us and china as offering us different things and of course they are both very important partners but more and more we are uh we are receiving a lot of attentions from different countries outside of the region or within the region and we should embrace a lot more diverse partnerships uh south korea um, is very active i think we are happy to have south koreans uh to provide us with the kind of assistance whether it's national stability or economic development uh same with india same with Middle Eastern countries, right? Saudi Arabia, UAE. Um, and I think the more that we develop diversify partnerships, um, the more that we can balance uh different kind of uh imperatives, whether economic or national stability. Um, I think in this sense, uh well, Singapore, of course, is the most uh developed in our in our region uh, they of course have their own advantages but the way that they have been uh, engaging uh, different countries I will say is kind of uh, uh, ex one example that how countries uh, can see right where Singapore basically has good ties with almost all major uh, countries uh, outside of the region right diversified partnership so that you don't really rely on one or the other for one particular thing or the other. Okay, uh, it's really, really, sorry the question, I think, because 
the unbalanced like you say unbalanced economic development in the southeast asean region become liability for the asean or for the member is up to develop more in to maintain and balancing the situation between china and us uh, there's uh, another question from the participant okay uh so ada lagi i think that uh, there is no oh. question okay because there is no question uh from the participant uh, particip participant i want to say really really thank you and our honor to have you dr cho as uh, our guest lecture for today uh, it's really really enlightening us because like indonesia is will be has an election next year and china will come become the main major issue okay. on that election and it will be influenced how china and american relation in region and indonesia especially in the next year will be will be affected because yeah. of this i think yeah. it will be interesting to see next year I think. <laughs> definitely i'm also very interested also <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, because there's no other question I want to close this seminar I really really thank you for Dr. Cho for enlightening us with with his talk with your presentation really really helpful to understand the relation between ASEAN Amer US and China in the region I, I hope um, your academic will be more spread around Indonesia and region itself what your talk about the relationship and what your talk about the how ASEAN should be will be implemented in the policy maker I think it's really really good to have you in here so I want to class and thank you for the all participants in here the absent will be sharing in the chat question uh, column chat column so you need to uh, submit your name in there to get the certificate So thank you for the time. I'm really close. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right. Thank you. Hope see you again, Dr. Cho. And I hope right. I can talk with you more because you're really, really interesting for, for me. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure. I will be happy thank to you. speak to you again or with others as well. Uh, it's my uh, honor and my uh, pleasure to, uh, to be speaking here today. I wish all of you uh, all the best as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Yeah. Ah, uh, sorry, sir. Ke ah, lupa foto. <laughs> Astaga, lupa foto tadi. Saya udah SS, cuma nggak.